So as I told you, today we are going to discuss Inguinal Canal and Inguinal Hania. You are all aware that last week we discussed the anterior abdominal wall. And during that last week, we discussed about the anterior abdominal wall muscles, as well as other layers that we have discussed. You can remember very well, there were about six layers in the anterior abdominal wall. The first one is the skin, which we have already said it. The second one is the superficial fascia made up of the fatty and membranous layer. The third one is the muscular layer, right? And then in, the, in, in those muscular layers, we discussed the three aponeuroses of these three muscles of the anterior abdominal wall, you know? The internal external oblique muscles, the internal oblique muscle, and the other one is what? The transversus abdominis. Those one in the middle, one on the right, one on the left side, we said they are called the recti muscles. That is the rectus abdominis on either side of the body. I hope you, are, you have remembered. And so, so we said deep inside the muscles, we talked about the transversalis fascia. You get my point. And after the transversalis fascia, the next one is the uh, extra peritoneal tissue or fat, and then you now reach your uh, parietal peritoneum. That is fine. So, if you can remember vividly, during the last lecture, we said the external oblique muscle of the abdomen, towards its own insertion, it ends into a flattened tendon, right? That is aponeurosis. So also the other three, other two muscles that we have said, internal oblique and transversus. So we, 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 you can also remember that we said the inferior border of that external oblique muscle, you know, it reflects inward, or it rolls inward to form what you call ilio inguinal ligament. Are you clear? So that ilio inguinal ligament, we said, is nothing but the rolled in fibers of the aponeurosis of the external oblique muscle of the abdomen. So, and that inguinal ligament actually is a misnomer. Misnomer in the sense that it's not really a ligament, but rather the lower edge of the aponeurosis of which, of course, aponeurosis, you know, is a tendon, right? So, this ligament, so called, begins from the anterior superior iliac spine, if you can remember part of the attachment or origin of the external oblique muscle we said it also originated from the anterior superior iliac spine known as assis that is anterior superior iliac spine right and so this road in fibers of this external oblique muscle of the abdomen it begins from here you get it and then it passes obliquely downward and towards the medial side so it runs inferior medially that is an atomic term so, the ilioinguinal ligament passes inferior medially from the anterior superior iliac spine down to the pubic tubercle. If you can remember, we said that the pubic tubercle is a protrusion. You get it? A growth of bone that is lying just by the side of the pubic symphysis. If you can remember, we talked about the pubic symphysis, which is a joint between the two pubic bones. We have the pelvic bones one on the left, one on the right. The two unite in the middle at the pubic symphysis. So by the lateral side of the pubic symphysis, you have a small growth of bone, what we call pubic tubercle. And that is the attachment of the ilioinguinal ligament. Why I'm emphasizing on this ilioinguinal ligament? Because what we are going to discuss now is with regard or is in relation to this ilioinguinal ligament. That is what we call inguinal canal. So inguinal canal is actually not a real canal per se. You get my point? But rather it's a passageway. When we talk about the passageway, we're talking about you know, something like a gutter. You get it? Through which something is going to pass through. You get my point? So inguinal canal is a passage, just like you know, a passage. If, if I open this door, I just ask each one of you to get out. There is a path, a path that you want to pass for you to be able to go into your respective uh, places you get it so it's like a passageway in that something must have passed through that passageway what is that something the testicles if i don't know whether you have not yet done the embryology of the testicles testicles you get my point they take origin from the posterior abdominal wall at the back from inside the abdomen so they travel all the way from the posterior abdominal wall they travel down 
So that means they migrate, they take a journey from that posterior abdominal wall, upper part, and then they come down. And then they now pass inferior medially and then come out of this inguinal canal. So that means this path, the inguinal canal, is created naturally by the trouble or by the Israeli of, you know, the testicles itself. You get my point? Israeli is just a, an Arabic word to journey, to, 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 to travel. You get my point? So now we've seen that the inguinal canal is created by the traveling or the movement of or the migration of the testicle from the posterior abdominal wall down into the external uh, external environment. Why this journey is as a result of testes, they don't like the internal temperature of our abdomen. Otherwise, if the testicles remain within the abdomen, obviously you will not be able to deliver any baby. So you'll be infertile. And that is why God Almighty decided to bring the testicles outside the abdomen. But it developed from within the abdomen but because internal temperature of our abdomen is far greater than the external temperature, you get it? The difference of almost 1 to 1.2 degrees centigrade. And so the testicles are able to produce the sperm cells while they are outside the abdomen. But if they are inside, they can no longer produce that. So that it means, it happens to say that those people with retained testicles within the abdomen, they will never be able to get a child or children after the become matured and they get married, so they will never get kids. So what is this inguinal canal we say is an oblique canal that is passing obliquely downward, lying parallel to the medial half of the ilioinguinal ligament. So since we have already discussed the ilioinguinal ligament, if you now take, if you divide the inguinal ligament into two portions, lateral half and medial half, so the medial half of the ilioinguinal ligament, this inguinal canal lies above and parallel to this medial half of the ilioinguinal ligament. Are you clear? We said the inguinal canal lies above about 0 0.5 inch. Did you, hear, did you hear what I said? I said the inguinal canal lies 0 0.5 inch above and parallel to the medial half of the ilioinguinal ligament. That means the ilioinguinal ligament begins at a point what we call mid-inguinal point. And this mid-inguinal point, we said, is a point that is halfway between the ilioinguinal ligament. And that is exactly why you are going to feel what we call a femoral pulse. Femoral pulse, when somebody now is brought to you to the clinic and probably maybe people are saying that this person is dead i say doctor if you want to confirm whether the person is dead or alive you have to first and foremost check for the pulsation of the arteries unfortunately at times those arteries in the upper limbs may not likely be felt probably that person is fat but when you now open the trousers or the socket of that woman or man you can now put your finger Midway between the anterior superior iliac spines, that means you have to find that landmark. You also have to find that landmark of the pubic tubercle. And then midway between, you now put your finger on top of that mid portion. Then if the person is alive, you are going to feel the position of this artery, what we call femoral artery. And with the vein on its own medial side, sorry, I, I, I didn't write it correctly. The femoral vein is supposed to be on this uh, medial side, you know. So now we have this bit in the point whereby you are going to have, you know, the, the femoral pulsation. So as we now said that the inguinal canal, you know, is a passageway lying above and parallel to the medial half of the inguinal ligament. So it's just like, you know, a rectangular kind of or a cylindrical kind of, you know, passageway whereby it has what we call anterior wall it has a posterior wall, it has a roof, and then it has a flu. You get my point? Just think of this classroom to be like the femoral canal. So this classroom, you know it has a roof up. It has a flu here while you people are sitting now. And then it has a wall on this side. 
and then it has wall on the other side. But then one will ask now, it has some exit, front exit and the backward back exit. Unfortunately, here we don't have the back exit. Ideally, if we were to have another exit here, that will serve as the openings of the femoral canal. When we talk about a canal, that means it has some openings, back opening and front opening. So the back opening of the inguinal canal is what we call deep inguinal ring. So deep inguinal ring is the hole where this inguinal canal begins. And this hole, you know, we said it is related to the, you know, mid inguinal point about 0 0.5 inch above the mid inguinal point. That is where the deep inguinal ring begins. The outer opening of the inguinal canal is what we call external inguinal ring. So we have external inguinal ring that is a deficiency, a defect on the aponeurosis of the external oblique muscle of the abdomen. So we have two rings. But unfortunately, even this external inguinal ring is not really a ring per se. Because when you now dissect the abdomen, if you say your dissection, when you now come on the medial aspect of the lower quarter of the external, uh, external aponeurosis, you are going to see that this opening through which this content of the inguinal canal pass, you are going to see that it is triangular in shape. So that means this opening is not round, it is triangular, you get it? So the sides are thickened. So it means that we have what you call a medial cruise and a lateral cruise of the external inguinal ring, which we said is a misnomer. When we say something is a misnomer, that means it's not the actual name per se. You get it? Because we said it's triangular, so it's not round. So we said it's triangular. So that means if we said that the ring is thickened both laterally and medially. So on the medial side, we have medial cruise, and on the lateral side, we have a lateral cruise. So the flow of this ring is mainly formed by this aspect of the, you know, the uh, part of the fibers of the external inguinal, you know, uh, aponeurosis. Are you clear? So now we have seen that the femoral canal begins from the deep inguinal ring down to the external inguinal ring. So what are the walls of this inguinal canal? The anterior wall is mainly formed by the external oblique aponeurosis. If you can remember, we said that the external oblique muscle of the abdomen, as it approaches toward the midline, it terminates into a flattened tendon. Are you clear? That flattened tendon now, you know, uh, the aponeurosis, form the lateral, the medial to third of the anterior wall of the inguinal uh, canal. Are you clear? So the lateral one third of the inguinal canal is formed by the fibers of the internal oblique muscle of the abdomen. If you can remember, we say deep to the external oblique muscle is which muscle? Internal oblique. You get my point? And even that internal oblique, if you can remember about its own origin, we said that it originates from the lateral half of the ilioinguinal ligament. So part of its origin now, as it is going upward and towards the medial side, it also form, forms lateral, lateral one third of the anterior wall of the inguinal canal. While the medial two third of the inguinal canal is mainly formed by the external oblique muscle of the abdomen, aponeurosis. So the aponeurosis of the external oblique now forms the medial two third of the wall of the anterior, uh, anterior wall uh, of the inguinal canal, and the lateral one third is formed by the internal oblique muscle of the abdomen. That is for the anterior wall. For the posterior wall, you know, the internal oblique muscle, as they pass upward and towards the medial side, they tend to act over the inguinal canal to form something like a roof over the content coming out of the abdomen, thereby forming the roof of the inguinal canal. So as this 
internal rubric model is the arc. They now pass behind to, uh, in to insert into the pubic tubercle here. So by so doing, another muscle, what you call the transversus abdominis muscle, you know, it is deep to the internal oblique muscle. So from deep inside of the internal oblique muscle, this transversus abdominis join with this item fibers of the internal oblique to form what you call a conjoint tendon. This conjoint tendon now forms part of the posterior wall of the inguinal canal. While the remaining wall, if you can remember, we said that deep to the uh, 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 transversus abdominis, we have transversalis fascia. So the transversalis fascia completes the remaining posterior wall of the inguinal canal. So the posterior wall of the inguinal canal is mainly formed on the medial side by the transversus abdominis muscle and the internal oblique muscle of the abdomen, the two together as they form the conjoint tendon. So the conjoint tendon on the medial side forms part of the posterior wall, while the remaining portion of the posterior wall is formed by the transversalis fascia. Are you clear? Good. So now the roof is mainly formed by the conjoint tendon, formed by the arching fibers of the internal oblique plus the transversus abdominis muscle. So these are the two you know, structures or muscles that form the uh, roof of the inguinal canal. While the flu, as we have already talked about this inguinal ligament, it's supposed to say that the flow of the inguinal canal is mainly formed by the uh, inguinal ligament. That means the inguinal ligament forms the flow of the inguinal canal. Now we have seen, you know, the inguinal canal beginning from the internal inguinal ring, ending into the external inguinal ring. We said it has a roof, it has a flow, has anterior wall, and has posterior wall. We have already made mention the sections that pass through the uh, inguinal canal. We said that the testicles, as they migrate from the posterior abdominal wall, they come down. As the testicles are coming, before they now come outside of the anterior abdominal wall, they must push together certain structures. Because if you can remember, we said that from inside the abdomen, we talked about the transversalis fascia. So the testicle must perforate the transversalis fascia before they are able to come out. So as the, the testicles now push the transversalis fascia, so the testicle comes out with the sheet of transversalis fascia covering it. As it is perforating the internal oblique muscle of the abdomen, it also takes some of the aponeurosis of the internal oblique muscle to cover that testicles and the content that it comes with. And again, as it is coming out, the aponeurosis of the external oblique muscle also must cover the testicle and the content that it comes with. So that means the testicles and the sections that follow the testicles they are going to be covered with three layers of membranes. The transversalis fascia from the inside, the internal oblique aponeurosis, the second one, then the last one, the most external, is the aponeurosis of the external oblique muscle of the abdomen. So that means the testis and the cord that is attaching the testicle, they are all covered by these three membranes, what we call the fasciae, which will discuss these three fasciae along the line when we come to discuss what we call the spermatic cord. So that means the cord that attaches the testicle is what we call spermatic cord. So we will now discuss about the content of the inguinal canal. So the inguinal canal in both male and female, it has this content, what we call ilioinguinal nerve. So the ilioinguinal nerve is the first content of the inguinal canal. So it is present in all the sexes. That means it is present in the canal of the woman, also in the canal of the female. You get my point? So it is in either sexes. So, but in the males, the inguinal canal contains what you call spermatic cord. You get my point? So inguinal canal in males contains spermatic cord. While in the female, it contains what you call round ligament of the uterus. Women do have uterus. Men, we don't have uterus. We only have 
you know, the remnant of the uterus, which when you discuss the pelvis and perineum, you will see what we refer the remnant of the uterus. So, in the female, the inguinal canal contains the round ligament of the uterus. We call it round ligament. Round ligament of the uterus, but in the males, it contains the spermatic cord. So now, let us discuss what are the contents of the spermatic cord, since it is the content of the inguinal canal. So spermatic cord, that is what we call a rule of three. We call it what? Rule of three. So we said that spermatic cord has three fasciae. As I was describing before, I said that as the testicles now come from the abdomen, they take along with them the transversalis fascia. It takes along with it the aponeurosis of the internal oblique muscle and the aponeurosis of the external oblique muscle. So the deepest covering of the spermatic fascia, which is this one here, is what we call the internal spermatic fascia. So the internal spermatic fascia is derived from the transversalis fascia. As it perforates the internal oblique upon neurosis, the testicles and the spermatic they also take another covering. That covering from the upon neurosis of the internal oblique muscle, it is what we call chilimasteric fascia. Are you clear? So this is the second fascia known as chilimasteric fascia. But apart from taking the upon neurosis of the internal oblique muscle, some of the fibers of the internal oblique they also lie along with this fascia. And so that means this cremasteric fascia is plus one muscle, what we call cremasteric muscle. This cremasteric muscle is very important during sexual intercourse because the muscle contracts so that to allow for the testicles to move and what have you. So the cremasteric muscle plus the fascia, they are derived from the internal oblique muscle and it is on aponeurosis. The, the outermost fascia that covers the spermatic cord is from the external oblique aponeurosis and that is what we call external spermatic fascia. So we have now seen the three fasciae covering the spermatic cord. So we have seen the fasciae. It also contains three arteries. You know for any structure in the human body there must be a blood supply. And since we said that the testes now they develop from the posterior abdominal wall closer to the iota. So that those testicles now, because they are closer to the iota, there is an artery coming from the abdominal iota supplying each of the, uh, each of the testicles. And that artery supplying the testis is what we call testicular artery. So there is a testicular artery supplying the testicles, so it follows the testicles. So it is part of the content of the inguinal canal. So if you can remember, I also discussed about the cremasteric muscle or the cremaster muscle. That cremaster muscle, as we said, it is part of the, you know, internal oblique muscle of the abdomen. So, because the muscle is closer to these branches of this, uh, you know, arteries coming from the femoral artery, what we call superior, inferior epigastric artery, it passes superiorly and medially to go up towards the thorax. And then it meets with another artery coming from the thorax. This one below is what we call inferior epigastric artery. So one coming from the thorax is what we call superior epigastric artery. The two anastomos, you know, at the back of the anterior abdominal wall. We, we don't care about this for now. What we care now is the inferior epigastric artery. So this epi, if inferior epigastric artery gives a branch to the muscles that are arching over the inguinal canal to give supply to this cremasteric muscle. So the second artery, part of the content of the inguinal canal, apart from the testicular artery, is the cremasteric or crem cremaster art artery to the cremasteric muscle. Are you clear? So also, the testis, you know, it is responsible for the production of sperm cells. After produce, producing the sperm cell, the sperm cells, they now travel through a tube. That tube, we call it vas difference. The tube that conveys the sperm cells after production from the testicles 
is what we call bus difference. And it also it passes through the inguinal canal and it also has a blood supply. So the blood supply to that bus difference comes from a vessel supplying the bladder. You get my point. And that is what you call a branch from the superior basal artery. So we call it artery to the bus. So the artery, the third artery is what we call artery to the bus, which is a branch of the superior vesical artery supplying the superior part of the bladder. Are you clear? So we now saw that we have three arteries accompanying the, you know, testicle or content of the inguinal canal. Testicular artery from the abdominal iota, artery to the bus, a branch of the superior vesical artery, and then cremasteric artery, a branch of the inferior vesical artery. So we have now seen the three arteries. The three veins, the, the, the three veins, you know, that, that's what we call pompiniform plexus. Pompiniform plexus, there are flexuses of veins around the vast difference, you know, so that they drain the testicle. They drain the blood around the testicles and then they go up and unite as what we call the testicular V. And so we have uh, pompiniform plexus, and then we have vein of the cremaster muscle, and then we have vein of the vast difference. So that means those veins, their own names, are similar to the arteries of the spermatic cord. The only difference is with this is with this uh, pompiniform plexus. If you like, you can also say testicular vein, if you cannot remember the pompiniform plexus. So we have now seen that it has three fasciae, three arteries, three veins, and then three nerves. So there are also three nerves among the content of the inguinal uh, canal. So the, what are these nerves? There is uh, uh, now what we call sympathetic nerves. You know, for each blood vessels in our own human body, wherever you see blood vessels, there must be some nerves, you know, to the vessels. Those vessels are the sympathetic nerves. So the sympathetic nerves accompanying those arteries, the testicular artery we have been mentioning, the artery to the vas and the chemosteric artery, you get it, they are all being supplied by sympathetic nerves. So this sympathetic nerve is part of the content of the inguinal canal. The second one is what we call nerve to the cremosa muscle, which is a genital branch of the genital femoral nerve. When you come to the pelvis and perineum, you will see where this genital branch of the genital femoral nerve comes from. And the last one is what we call ilio inguinal nerve. This ilio inguinal nerve is from the lumbar plexus, plexus from the back. When you come to do your uh, posterior abdominal wall, you are going to discuss the lumbar plexus. So this ilio inguinal nerve is one of the first branches of that, you know, plexus of the nerves. So ilio inguinal nerve actually is not within the spermatic cord. It is outside the cord, attached to the cord, but it's not within the content, but it's outside. But for the sake of completeness, that is why to make it the actual rule of three, that is why we always include the inguinal nerve as part of the content of the inguinal canal, you know? But it's not within the spermatic cord, but it is part of the content of the inguinal canal. Did you get the difference? I said, Ilioinguinal nerve is not a part of the content of the spermatic cord, but it is the content or part of the content of the ilioinguinal canal. Are you clear? Good. So the other, it has also three other structures. What are these three other structures? The three other structures here we have what you call the vast difference. We have already discussed about the vast difference, which is a tube conveying the cells that are being produced by the testicles. Are you all clear? So once the testis, if this is the testis now, produces the sperm cells inside. So the sperm cells, they traveled through the vast difference and the, 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 the sperm cells, they pass through the inguinal canal. You get it, you know? They pass through the inguinal canal and then they enter into the penis. You know the penis is outside, so it passes into the penis. Are you clear? Good. So we have now seen that. Apart from the vast difference being part of the three other structures, the second one is the lymphatics. You, you see, most or all most of the structures in our body, with some few exceptions in the human body, they have been drained by lymphatics. 
lymphatic vessels. And so we have lymph vessels also draining the content of the spermatic cord. So the last one is what we call patent processes vaginalis. Patent processes vaginalis for people who have a retained processes vaginalis, part of the embryonic, you know, uh, cavity coming, you know, through the ileoinguinal canal. For those that have that, so they have the third other structures with regard to the content of the ileoinguinal canal. So you have about 15 contents of the inguinal canal, 14 of the spermatic cord. So that means spermatic cord has 14 contents. The inguinal canal has 15. Are you clear?